Hi, welcome to B&H Real Exposures, where we interview today's top pros. We ask these rock stars of photography in-depth questions to get insight you won't find anywhere else. I'm David Brommer, your host of Real Exposures, and today we're sitting with Eileen Rafferty, a photographer and educator of exceptional nature. Eileen has dedicated her lifetime to the exploration of the creative process, utilizing photography and technology, along with writing, mixed media, and video. Eileen is an instructor at the Rocky Mountain School of Photography and lives in Missoula, Montana. Eileen also runs a photography consulting business and is the lady behind the print magazine Butterflies and Anvils. In her short years here on Earth, Eileen has worked as a freelancer, a custom darkroom printer, holds a Bachelor of Science in Physiology and an MFA in Photography Film. On a personal note, I met Eileen last year when she first presented here at the event space and I was astonished at how she approaches and codifies the creative process. Eileen fosters a supportive nature to encourage people to harness their inner creativity, and that just may be her strongest gift yet. Eileen, thank you very much, and welcome for coming to Real Exposures. Thanks, David. So, uh, you just uh, you had a great presentation this morning in the event space, and thank you're going you. to have another one coming up. So mm -hmm. we're sandwiching this in the middle, and I'm really I'm, I'm glad that you could find the time to do this. Sure. Um, Eileen, you're truly a multi-dimensional creative. Uh, you don't limit yourself to just photography, you use video, um, you uh, even use still films, even a little bit of appropriation there. I saw using your father's Super 8 film, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um, to incorporate all these different uh, things into your photography, was that a result of you going back to school and getting an MFA? It was, yeah. I, I, I was trained in film and was trained in the darkroom, and that was my medium, uh, mostly black and white film for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Uh, partially because I was a custom darkroom printer, and so I got, you know, keys to the darkroom and could mm -hmm. use it anytime I wanted. Uh, but I felt like I was starting to hit a wall with my photography, uh, you know, especially in the days of film when the technology wasn't changing so rapidly. Uh, I felt like I really had my technical skills down, and I was getting to the point that I could make that image that I had in my head. Mm. And that's exciting, and, and I was proud of that, but I felt like I was getting to that point of, so what? So what's next? What can I do with this? And I decided to go to, to uh, get my master's, to get mm. my MFA. And that's really what uh, really blew the lid off the top of mm. what photography could be to me. Uh, and that's when I was exposed. I went to a very multidisciplinary school. Um, and that's when I was exposed which to school? Uh, VCU in Richmond, Virginia. Mm. Uh, and that's where I was exposed to uh, you know video, sculpture, painting, drawing. I always knew that existed, but mm. I was now in a program with people who were incorporating many different mediums with their work. Uh, and also started to understand more the history of, mm -hmm. of art, history of photography, mm -hmm. started to get into more critical theory and realizing that concepts behind my work was really important. <clears throat> so that is really those two years, is, and also just having two years to do nothing but make your art, and that's your job mm -hmm. for two years. Uh, so it was great to just be in the studio and I, I gave myself no limitation as far as what material or uh, whatever idea came in my head, I, I just decided to make it, and it was a really freeing time. Now, you, you have a, a, a Bachelor of Science in Physiology, mm -hmm. and then you went for a Master's of Fine Art. Mm -hmm. How did the physiology, uh, how did that lay the, the, the ground path for what you've been doing? Yeah, well, I mean, I believe everything that we do in life lays a ground path for our mm -hmm. work, everything. Uh, nothing's meaningless, I think. Um, and I didn't realize it consciously, but one of the first bodies of work that I was doing that got into mixed media was uh, I was taking photographs with my digital camera of objects around my environment um, and abstracting them and then turning those, uh, doing image transfers onto uh, gel medium skin hmm. and then sewing those into big panels. And I didn't realize until I hung them and looked at them on the wall that they looked completely like biomorphic, you know, biological insides of human bodies. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't until I saw that that I, I thought, oh my gosh, it's it's my it's my physiology it's background. It's mm. the, those visuals that I had in my head, and also just, uh, you know, I, I think that any other field that we can understand and study always informs the photography. I don't like to just live in the photography bubble, mm -hmm. so um, so I'm sure it, it informs me more than I realize. You know, a lot of our audience, uh, they, you, know, you said, I got a digital camera, and we're coming to an age now where 
uh, this new group of photographers has never shot with film. They never did. They, their first camera at 15, 16 years old was a, uh, a Nikon uh, you know, a D3000 or a, a Canon Rebel. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my first camera was a Polaroid 600 land camera. What, what was your first camera? Man, I think it was like the Pentax K1000, okay. the old workhorse, the, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I have probably. one in my collection. It's <laughs> yeah. a, it's yeah. a perfect camera. So with this uh, influx of, of uh, people getting digital cameras, and they're, they're so malleable, and, and you get such great results quickly, uh, that we're getting a group of photographers that aren't trained as photographers. So do you have anything you would say for someone who's maybe found their voice with this new acquisition and they want to get more into photography? Uh, your path going into a more formal education mm -hmm. versus, let's say, a one-week workshop or something longer. How do you feel about that? It is the question, how how could they further themselves as photographers, technically and conceptually? I think, yeah. You know, they, they found their, they, they got their camera. Mm -hmm. They're starting into photography. Okay. What's next for them? Okay. Well, I would think if you're very new to photography, then to learn the technical skills, workshops are great. Mm -hmm. Workshops, weekend seminars, these these you know short little stints. Mm -hmm. uh, one because uh, they're usually, especially if you find a, a beginner's uh, or a basic photography mm -hmm. class, they're going to be geared towards helping you to learn that machine, right? Our little computer that's in our hand, that is our mm -hmm. camera. Not to mention the computer we have to use to express ourselves mm -hmm. later with the post processing. So I think that's essential because, as I said in class this morning. Um, you know, you can have a vision, but it's hard to execute that vision with this medium unless you technically know how to use mm -hmm. use the tools. So that's essential. So I think workshops and shorter programs mm -hmm. are great for that. Um, I think MFA programs, you know, they're all very different. The one that I experienced um, was way more focused on the conceptual side of mm -hmm. the work, uh, having a vision, having a voice, having an idea, having a story to tell, and then um, you know, choosing the right materials and methods to to push that idea, to communicate that idea, that would all probably be lost on a brand new photographer who can't even um, doesn't know what dial changes the aperture okay. yet. So I really think for beginners beginners to learn the techniques, workshops are a great thing. Um, I you know by the time I went to graduate school, I was you know very technically proficient in the mm. medium. Also, graduate school isn't meant to uh, teach you how to do aperture and shutter speed because they mm -hmm. assume you've done that in undergrad. Mm -hmm. So graduate school <clears throat> is really that place to to push that conceptual side. And also I think it helps you be able to work in projects and series mm -hmm. and then know how to how to get the work out there for people to see. Okay, so let's say that you you picked up photography, you got a knack for it, you figure out the mechanics mm -hmm. of it. The, you know enough stop from a bus stop and you've got mm -hmm. that worked out. Uh, and you really feel the siren call. You want to go further. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, you, you you went through college and mm -hmm. something like physiology or something is not directly related to photography, but you want to take the next step and go for an MFA. How do you identify a school or a program? Is there any uh, tips for that? Yeah, I think there's lots of tips. I mean, I have students come to me all the time and ask this who are on my workshops and more of the workshop type program. Um, you know, there's factors like time. Some programs are two years, some are three. There's factors like mm -hmm. expenses, you know, going to an in-state state school versus going to an out-of-state private school. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so those are huge. How much money do you want to spend? How much time do you want to invest? That's a first first step. Uh, but then scums, their schools are very different. Some schools are really heavily focused in commercial photography, mm -hmm. uh, the technical aspects of photography, you know, studio work, mm -hmm. meaning studio lighting. Other schools uh, you can major in photography and you could not touch a camera and use paint the entire two years mm -hmm. and they wouldn't care, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you know, some programs are way more conceptual, some way more commercially based. So I think that's important to figure out what you need from this MFA, what you want to get out of it. Uh, and then I always advise students to look at the faculty, look at the kind of work that the faculty's making, look at the kind of artists mm -hmm. they are and photographers they are, and then and then look at the graduate work. Every every reputable school should have a sampling of the graduate mm -hmm. work that the Usually students are doing. A catalog of some sort. Yeah, or catalog or online, yeah. you know, gallery something. Mm -hmm. Look at the work that's that's out there, and if it's work that feels like it's aligned with your work, or maybe not, maybe it's just the work that you that it's exciting to you. Um, then that might be the school for you. You know, a couple of things that you get from an MFA, and, and I don't have an MFA, by the way, I'm mm -hmm. a school of hard knocks, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
the uh, you learn the language and there's a vocabulary yeah. that that comes along with the MFA. Mm -hmm. I used to joke when I would write artist statements and say I have to get out my MFA dictionary and mm -hmm. uh, at least you were writing artist statements though. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, right, you know, you talk a lot about writing, and I yeah. do. I'm with you 150 percent. There, writing mm -hmm. is 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 key, and it's you know I think it can melt with blogs so well. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, so you uh, when you partake of an MFA, you, you definitely learn the vocabulary. But something that you said before, conceptualization, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of us uh, as photographers, we see images that are easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be like let's say you're doing journalism and you see Eddie Adams. A photograph of the the execution. I mean, it's very easy to figure out that photograph. Uh, but when you get into MFA work, uh, the conceptualization becomes so great that sometimes it's difficult to find the meaning yes. inside of it, yes. especially for an outside viewer. Would you say how would you contend with that? Is there a, is there a way to to understand uh, conceptual artwork or uh, have it uh, produce it and be able to have an audience for it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a spectrum. I mean, I have to. Um you know, not to call you out in any way, David, but, um, you know, even the Eddie Adams photo, uh, you know, we think we can understand a photograph, but there's more to that story. Mm -hmm. right. You know, there was a huge outcry mm -hmm. of, of against the Vietnam War to that photograph, but there was actually a bigger story around that photograph mm -hmm. that wasn't seen. So every photograph has a story beyond the frame anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even something at face value has more than we probably think that it does. That being said, yes, then there can be the work that's so obtuse you can't even mm -hmm. get through it, right? Um, I have a couple thoughts about that. One is sometimes I think that as viewers, when we go into a museum or a gallery and we see work that we don't understand, it's really easy to write it off because we don't get it, mm -hmm. right? Or something that seems so simple, like when someone maybe first saw a Jackson Pollock painting, how many times have you heard, well, my kindergartner could do that? <laughs> Probably not, right? And I always say to students when they say, well, I could do that, I say, well, but you didn't, right? There's a difference between thinking you can do it and actually doing it, right? right. So I think that, that when we don't understand art that we encounter, you know, what I've learned is to step back and, or maybe if we don't like it, right, is to step back and say, well, what, a, you know, can I learn something from it? What don't you like about it? Or what don't you understand about it? Or <clears throat> read the little plaque on the side and maybe maybe suddenly there's more to it than meets the eye. I think I sense a, an assignment here. <laughs> Find a piece on the surface makes no <laughs> right? sense to you and yeah. then look into it and try to yeah. understand it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, but I do think that as artists, we want to communicate something. And so for me personally, um, I, I want to welcome my viewers in. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it has to be completely literal, but I would hope there's something that pulls them in, whether it's visual or conceptual. And you had mentioned the artist statement, and that's the key of the artist statement. The artist statement is the bridge between the viewer and the work. So that's how you help the viewer understand if it is abstract or if it is sort of obtuse. The statement is mm -hmm. the bridge to help them understand the mm -hmm. work more. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's that could be contentious because I've I've read some awful MF or some some awful also, artist statements that are, that are really can be obtuse too. So somebody needs to uh, well that's probably I would say I, I would say that's not a good artist statement I would say an artist statement should um, enlighten the viewer not shut them out you know I, I was reading through your, your uh, website this morning and uh, and your statement I thought was extremely clear and I even repeated it out to, to my wife who's a Bauhaus trained artist and, mm. oh, awesome. and she she gave it a, a big thumbs up and oh, she used to be a, a museum manager so gave yeah, it a, yeah. but it was it was it was nice it was it wasn't spoken in, in such a, a highfalutin way yet it it was you know in yeah. a way but it wasn't it informed the the, the reader right, right. what was going on yeah. um, okay so I'm going to get into a little bit about uh, about video and uh, you've incorporated a little bit of video the, these stills and now cameras have taken this big technological leap that they're capable of doing incredibly high-end video. Are you utilizing any of that or are you working with this antiquated film super A? What's the... Yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, when I went to graduate school, we had to major in, it, they called it photography and film, which would be photography and video today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went kicking and screaming uh, because I didn't care about the moving image at that mm -hmm. point. Um, now I'm really glad I did. Um, it also turned into my final thesis show was moving image. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, and then suddenly, you know, we now we have the, I call it the darling of photography video. Um, uh, so I was really excited when that, when that technology came about, mm -hmm. right, um, in our DSLRs. Uh, 
yes, I'm utilizing it, meaning that yes, I shoot video, yes, I have um, projects that I'm working on now that incorporate video, uh, but I'm still thinking of them more in the uh, art conceptual realm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and I find that now that time has gone on, um, I feel a little bad confessing this, but I'm not as excited about the the technology with video as I was excited digging into my dad's old eight mm. millimeter films and using those. So uh, I think that, again, I don't think anything is meaningless. I think, and I, I love the ability to use video with our DSLRs, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that'll serve a purpose for me eventually. In fact, I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, but at this point, there's still, for me, nothing like looking at those. There's something really mysterious to me about that flicker of the mm -hmm. old film. Mm -hmm. um, and that just happens to be where I am currently in my art. Um, so I'm still kind of You're kind of grounded in the analog. <laughs> That's where I started, for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, are you playing with Final Cut at all? Yeah, I edit in Final Cut. Okay. And the, th the funny thing is, is I find that even now while I'm shooting HD video, I'm always doing something to degrade it hmm. in the software. So okay. I'm always trying to make it look scratched or old mm -hmm. or faded. Uh, so, so um, it's convenient that I have it in my camera and that I can just dump it right in the computer and use it. But I'm noticing, because I'm always learning my process as I go as well, that here I am degrading it to maybe try to make it look not so pristine and perfect and beautiful. Cool. Well, that leads me to my next question about Instagram. Ah. And how do you feel about Instagram and, and this, this wave of, of, is it really, you, take a, you could take either an iPhone, which is capable of a very good image, and right, then you image. Instagram it and you funkify mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. or you can even take uh, regular digital files and Instagram them. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? How, how does that uh, play on us? I think that it's exciting um, because it is putting the medium into the hands of everyone, mm -hmm. and it's a more uh, it's a wider view of what people are seeing, uh, and the technology is great. I mean, it's great that I can be walking down the street and bam, there it is to share, right? Um, I also think that it, like everything else, there's a, a plus and a minus. So I think it's exciting. I also think it's a new aesthetic, you know, that sort of snapshot aesthetic coming back if it ever went away. Uh, but I also think that at moments it can cheapen the medium a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we're inundated with images already. Mm -hmm. And um, how many more images of pink toenails and what I had for breakfast do we need? Mm, I don't know. I'm not really the judge of that. But I, f I feel like uh, on one hand, it's very exciting. On the other hand, it can potentially devalue mm. uh, um, the photographic image. Uh, and that's something that we as photographers, you know, I just wrote an article in my, in my magazine about this, that it's our responsibility as image makers then to put value back into our images. Mm. Yeah, we can make a beautiful, really cool looking photograph with our phone and put it up there for everybody to enjoy. That's exciting, that's awesome. But let's take it another step as photographers and artists and let's, what's the concept behind our work? Mm -hmm. Let's make projects, let's make bodies of work, let's publish books, let's have gallery exhibits, You know, let's tell stories, uh, but let's make it more than just the pretty snapshot. Um, that's our job as photographers. That's not the that's not the amateur consumer's hmm. job. But I would love if we could all elevate it, bring um, it up a little. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of uh, of this, uh, you, you have a, a print magazine, mm -hmm. Butterflies and Anvils. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, uh, how dare you run a print magazine <laughs> in today's world? Magazines are going out of business left and right. Yes. Ad revenues down. Uh, even Newsweek is going all digital, and here you are using Mad Cloud, which is uh, pretty mm -hmm. awesome. And it is. Uh, What's the impetus for behind that? What's the idea? Well, the idea behind the magazine was I call it a photographic journal about inspiration and art. Uh, the idea behind it was that I, f I feel like I have a lot of ideas and thoughts to share about the medium photography, having been in it for 15 years and studied it. And again, I, I teach a lot of photo history, so I have a, a long view mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and so I felt like I had a lot to share. I also feel like I have so many colleagues that are wildly talented mm -hmm. people who also have ideas to share. And I just felt like I wanted to start getting other people's voices out there. Uh, so that was the idea behind it. Then, of course, came the idea, okay, do I make it in a zine? You know, do mm -hmm. I make it um, a digital publication? And, you know, and here it could be my darkroom days again, but I really wanted something 
that was a tangible thing that you get in the mail that you wait for, okay? Mm. So like I get um, the journal New American Paintings. I can't wait for that magazine to come. And when it comes, I set aside time and I sit down and I look through it and I get inspired by the images. Mm -hmm. And that's different than sitting and staring at the glowing screen. Mm -hmm. Not that we can't get inspired by that, but it's a completely different experience. So in the introduction in the editor's letter to every magazine, I say, please lay down in the hammock, get a cup of tea, get a glass of wine, you know, plop up a pillow, whatever you have to do is lay in the sun and sit and enjoy the magazine. Mm. And also that idea that you can keep taking it off the shelf and coming back to mm. it. So I made a real conscious decision. It wasn't a lack of, you know, a lot of people have said, why don't you make it digital? Um, and, and I've made a really conscious decision that I want it to be a tangible thing that, that you hold in your hand and flip mm -hmm. through and feel the pages. And thank God, you know, MagCloud does a great job with say, their yeah. printing. They but do that, a great job. So it's quality. And if there's something like that available. Exactly, say, that too. We didn't have that years ago. It, no. was, it was a much costly thing to, yeah, I'm a big absolutely. lens work fan. Yes. And yes. that's the same, you know, I, I do look forward to getting it. It's yeah. uh, And reading it, who's profiled in it. Um, and their quality is, is great, yeah. but it's uh, it's cool that I think that you're, that you're doing something like this. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to subscribe. Okay, great. <laughs> I great. want in. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that I, I'm potentially limiting my my you know audience by not making it a PDF that someone can just download and look at. But I'm hoping that over time that it's again keeping the value of, of you, that. You may soften to that in a way. I hear you the, the mm -hmm. value, and you mm -hmm. a repetitive theme with you is that analog being able to touch it. Uh, but uh, Brooks Jensen from Lenswork, he talks all about the, the... And they have the online version. They have the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's uh, mm -hmm. PDFs and he says, you know, the place for everything. Yep. Yeah, nothing really does beat holding it in your hands. Yep. And then yeah. you can take it places, you can loan it easier. And I also wanted to, it was a new thing for me. I've just finished my second year. So I really wanted to make sure that, you know, you have a vision for something, can you execute it? And, and will it ever become exactly what you thought it would be? So it's entering so the second year. I just finished my second year. It's just entering the third year. Okay. So I really wanted to let it hash itself out and figure out what's working, what's not, what it becomes before mm -hmm. I, you know, not, not that putting it out there was going to be this big. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted it to, to live in this form and see what it becomes. And how do you lay it out? You're using MagCloud, but how do you lay out the magazine? I use Photoshop. Okay. <laughs> Which is silly. Page but I per do. page, you basically mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. and then it just template it into MagCloud's template. Yeah, you just export it as a okay. PDF and upload it to MagCloud. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So, Eileen, you have a very popular program, Fostering Creativity. It's where you quote many relevant photographers and writers on creativity. You speak in equal measure about your art and others. Um, I have a question for you, and that is: Are there creative exercises that you find most rewarding? Hmm. Uh. Well, I did talk this morning in my lecture about the importance of play and improv. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always important. You know, we can learn the technology and know how to do everything technically, and but sometimes you just have to let that all go and go play, right? Throw mm -hmm. the camera out of focus, swing it around, I don't know, shoot that's from exciting. the hip. Okay, so play I think is really important. Uh, and then also, um, you know, there's great value in, in finding uh, photography that you like and trying to mimic it. And that's not copying, you know, it's really not, but maybe it's, it's a style. So this mm -hmm. afternoon I'm talking about art movements through photography and the whole idea of the class is, do you love minimalism? Do you love the modernists? Do you love the abstract? Do you, mm -hmm. do you love the surrealists, right? And then, and then what about that work did you love? What exact, try to identify what you're enjoying about the work and then try to infuse that in your own work. So maybe you find you love negative space. Mm -hmm. Maybe you find you love uh, simple colors um, or high contrast. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great creative exercise is to identify what you love in photographs and then try to infuse that one thing in your work. So follow your heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to do the research to figure out what, what it is you like. Okay, so speaking of play, we're near the end of our real exposures, and we do something here. We do word association. Okay. So, are you ready for a little word association? Sure, I guess so. Okay. You know, so you know the rules to this game. The first thing comes to your mind, just blurt out. Okay. <laughs> uh, except, okay. <laughs> well, this is a family <laughs> show, Eileen. So I was going to say, okay. Uh, crayon. Color. Ritual. Practice. 24 frames per second. Film. Summit. Climbing. Ocean. Mm, peace. Film. Grain. Pixel. <sighs> Boring. Surprise. <laughs> Studio. OK. 
I want to bring you into Photographers Association, so I'm going to name a, a photographer, and okay. first thing comes to your mind, okay. Ruth Bernhard. <sighs> Exciting. Bernice Abbott. Mm. New York. Cindy Sherman. Self-portrait. Sally Mann. Mm. Exploration. Non Golden. Personal. Margaret Burke White. Mm. Strong. Lee Miller. Brave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you kind of summed up a lot of things that uh, I think that you incorporate into your, yourself and your photography. Mm. So it's really been a pleasure having you here on Real Exposures. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you and so much, looking David. forward to continuing you, our relationship and, and showing great work to, uh, to our event space attendees and B&H. Thank great. you for coming. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, you all want to catch the video that we're going to be showing uh, shortly. It is uh, Eileen Rafferty and a history of photography. Thank you very much for coming. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.